In this video I will give 5 do's and don'ts regarding watercolors that I figured out over the years, and some even just recently. Personally, I feel like the do's and don'ts format often simplifies things too much, because lots of aspects just aren't black and white. But we should still take a closer look at our medium, because there are topics that affect not only beginners, but all kinds of artists. Please feel free to share it with people that you think this video could help out. So let's start with number one. When you start painting, you really want to make sure what colors are granulating. Have you ever had watercolors dry down crumbled on your paper, making it goddamn hard to paint those sweet smooth areas? Worry no more. Their defect is called granulation, and it's not a lack of quality of your paints, but a natural property of certain pigments to agglomerate on the paper. You just ought to know which ones granulate and which ones don't. So let me illustrate that with an example. Here I use two ultramarines from Schmincke. One is ultramarine finest and the other one is French ultramarine. Both have a very similar tone, but don't let them fool you, they are not the same. I apply them with the same amount of water and let them dry. You might notice the French one dries down differently, that cheeky scrub. And as I said, it's not a question of quality. Here's what happens. When water is added, the pigments separate from the binder and settle into the valleys of the paper. As it dries in the valleys, it leaves a grainy texture. Cheaper colors actually tend to granulate less, because they are less pigmented. Using colors without knowing about the specific property might ruin the results we have in mind, leaving us in frustration when we try to get something even and clean. So what we don't want to do is letting these backstabber paints screw our paintings when this effect is not needed. But granulation isn't inherently bad, we just need to know about it so we can work with it and create interesting and beautiful paintings. In portrait painting it's great for freckles for example. Just use a tiny amount of granulating paint and spread it in the wet area. It's also a great tool to add texture to your landscape paintings. For example you can simulate surfaces like rocks and foliage with a nice and crisp grainy texture. The question you might have is, but how do I find out whether a color is granulating? Depending on the brand, you can check their website or simply swatch them on a different sheet of paper before you actually use them on your artwork. Number 2. Do acknowledge that some watercolors stain your paper more than others and don't just ignore that. Different watercolors are made from different pigments and just as with granulation, some colors are more likely to stay on your paper forever. No matter how hard you try, you can't remove them, while other colors are almost fully washable, which makes correcting much easier. There are some that stain your paper, which means it is hard or almost impossible to wash them off. Knowing this about your colors comes in handy, especially if you want to sketch with your colors and not pencils. Here for example, I sketch a landscape with washable colors, that in this case is the French ultramarine from earlier. With non-staining watercolors you can do something like an underpainting and with every new wash your initial sketch will disappear. On the other hand, it might not be that beneficial if you are working on a, let's say, deep and dark background. With every new wash you push and rub the colors away because they just won't stick to the paper, making layering hard and the whole job feel unrewarding and you won't have a fun time. So again. Don't get demotivated by certain colors that just won't come off your paper, or that leave holes when you strike over them with a brush. What you should want to do is using staining or non-staining colors purposefully, or at least know their features. To figure that out with your palette, do tests or look it up. Granulating colors normally are also non-staining, but it's safer to just try it yourself and go by experience. Number 3. The third tip is about watercolor edges. I noticed a common struggle with watercolors when trying to paint smooth gradients. It's easy to unintentionally add watercolor edges where there shouldn't be any. I experience a lot of people get frustrated by that, especially when it comes to painting skin because it becomes most visible when the skin almost looks like it got burned. The do and don't to this one might sound simple, but it's essential to achieve the intended result. Do wet the whole area that you want to have a smooth gradient and don't just wet a tiny spot when the colors are supposed to bleed together with the rest. Watercolors need water to flow. 
When you are working on a face and want to have a blended look, it's essential to wet the whole area and only then start adding color. Wash after wash you have to wet everything again to keep that look. Sometimes the paint dries unevenly, so you have to keep an eye on the drying process as well. If you have puddles on the paper, watercolor edges might appear around those areas, where the paper already dried while the puddles are still wet. All of this comes with experience, but still it is important to make behavior like this present. Number 4. A lot of you started wondering how I had so much control over the water in my brush. Don't start stroking without a tissue nearby, regardless of how messy or abstract your painting is going to be, you never want to miss the option to clean your brush. And it doesn't matter if it's a tissue, toilet paper or a cotton rag, as long as it absorbs water and color. This way you can affect whether you apply just a light shade or bold colors. It offers a way to match the tones with the color you previously used, so you don't unintentionally use too much color. Not only can you control the amount of color, but also the amount of water that is left in your brush. Knowing how wet or dry your brush is, is mandatory to avoid watercolor edges or purposefully use them. You don't want to have a big drop of water accidentally ruin your work. You can also use it to take color from your paper as long as it's wet, to lighten areas or to create textures like clouds. It's essential to correct mistakes. Use a tissue, always, for cleaning your brush, the paper and controlling the amount of water in your brush. Number 5. Use the right paper. That is not to say that there is wrong watercolor paper in general, but it should match your purpose. Depending on your usage, with watercolor paper you can go wrong sometimes. There are different purposes for different papers. I figured when your goal is to draw sketches with only one or two washes, 200 grams are alright. This paper won't bend as much as thinner paper, but it still happens sometimes, especially if it's not glued or stretched. I usually recommend 300 gram paper. It's thick enough to endure heavy washes of water and erasing pencil sketches as well. Normally you can't go wrong with it. Also using an eraser won't affect that paper as much as thinner products. Of course the texture should also fit your motive. Paper that was pressed by heated rolls is called hot pressed and due to that it has almost no texture at all. This makes it perfect for any kind of illustrative drawing, since it not only gives your painting a smooth look, but also because it's just simply easier to scan and print your work. Cold pressed paper on the other hand is still more common among watercolor artists. It has a rough and grainy texture that creates the typical watercolor look. It's more suitable for extreme wet and wet techniques. Stroking the brush rapidly on the dry surface gives an attractive look that you can't really achieve on hot press paper, making it interesting for landscape painting and those of the more expressive kind. So check if your paper matches your purpose. Paper that is too thin and gets wavy all the time, or paper that tears or creases when you use an eraser, is depressing and you won't find joy in working with materials that can't handle a project. To prevent situations like these, I recommend to do tests. Ask for and use samples from your store if that's possible and decide what paper fits your interest the best. You will figure out that it doesn't need to be expensive or high-end, but that it depends on your intentions. Alright, that was my 5 do's and don'ts for watercolors. As I said in the beginning, I don't want to dictate what to do and what not to do. All I wanted to say is that it's best to inform yourself before getting started. And I hope that I could achieve that with this video. How are your feelings towards do's and don'ts? Do you think it's helpful or limiting to present tips that way? And do you have other tips that I didn't mention? Please tell me in the comments. By the way, my art book is finally back in my Etsy shop. It is the second edition and I'm not sure if there's going to be a third one, so grab it while it's still there. If you order in November, you have a much better chance at receiving it before Christmas. Thank you very much for watching, see you in the comments or in the next video. Bye and have a great time.